at the scribe. And today will be a fun session to scribe rather than yesterday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you going to be in the Etherpad? Or so if you if you just append it underneath what's already there, I think that would be best. If that doesn't work, um, let us know and we'll tell people where they can help you. Thank you. Good morning. So this is quick. How has your ITF weeks been? It seems like weeks, doesn't it? So this is the note well statement. Again, if you're not familiar with this, please research it. Uh, it's important. It's the terms under which we participate here regarding intellectual property. And likewise, uh, let's remember to keep this a professional environment. If you have concerns or about harassment or, or similar issues, these kind people can help you. Uh, we can help you too, but these are the designated people for issues along those lines. Uh, and they have an email address on this, but it's team at ietf.org. Um, blue sheets? Um, I'll wait a few more minutes and then. Okay. Blue sheets will, will, will be forthcoming. We have identified a scribe. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, do we have a Jabber relay? Are you going to do that again? I can do it again. Great. Um, agenda bash. So yesterday was so much fun. We modified the agenda slightly for today. Um, we're going to spend a brief moment talking about the second implementation draft with Martin. Do we have Martin there? I don't see him yet, but hopefully he'll be along shortly. Just to confirm that the document, he did some editing while we slept or did something. And uh, we want to confirm that that's indeed where we want to go. Um, and then we will go on to the issues. Um, the two ones we have queued up uh, immediately with presentations is one about quick invariance from Martin. Yes. Hey, uh, can I suggest, uh, Ranjit, uh, can I suggest unidirectional streams be discussed first? It's a very fundamental change. I think we should set a deadline, and it should be today. So. So we talked about this, and uh, we think that, that quick invariance, we can actually achieve something, or at least time box that conversation. But we need to know something about that as well. Whereas we strongly suspect that unidirectional streams will expand to fill whatever time it is given. Does that make sense? Yep. OK. Um, and then at, uh, after we conclude uh, on unidirectional streams, uh, we'll, we'll have some presentations about quick ECN and some quick multipath experiments. Any other bashing? So those last two items you will, Ian, go. A uh, question, did you, did you want to give five or 10 minutes to the forced head of line blocking slides? It's oh. fluffy data. Oh, of course. Yes, we'll include that uh, in the related work at the end, if that's all right. Sure, sure, uh, I didn't know. If right. I didn't know the level of interest to in focus. So. Background, we, we had a, another presentation for the HTTP session uh, which uh, wasn't quite ready in time for, for various reasons. So we're going to try and insert that at the end here. Yeah, but either way, it should be on the materials. I, I sent them to you. So. Thank you. Yeah. The, the last two um, are obviously, you know, ECN, you can argue whether it's part of a charter or not. A multipath is, is you know, not yet. But um, we asked, so when the request came, we asked the proponents to focus on things related to multipath and things related to ECN that are sort of in, can inform the current design step, right? So basically, we want to know, is there anything that we're discussing now that will make multipath much harder or much easier, ideally, right? Um, so I think that should be the focus. And, and since folks have asked me whether you know uh, partial reliability would be something that we would talk about, it, I think it fits in the same category. It's not part of the initial charter, as far as I remember. But if you know um, we can make it easier later by doing something now uh, that's not in conflict with the charter, then that would be a good discussion to have. Um, the, the other quick thing I want to mention about the interop, right? We have uh, an in, interim coming in Seattle. Uh, we mentioned it in October. I think it's October 3 to 5, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. I strongly suspect that in, remote interop will continue um, sin, until then, right? Since we have a bunch of people that, that have stacks 
Um, if you have a stack um, and you haven't participated on the weekend, right? You don't have to wait until Seattle to come. You can email, you know, Mark and me, and then so there's a Slack that is set up for people with stacks to chat about what happens when they run against each other. Um, there's various scaffolding that that people are proposing, like framework to run these things in a, in a sort of more structured way against each other. So if, if you have a stack, especially if it's a closed source stack, since I think all the ones that we currently are are seeing our open source, right? You know, don't wait until to Seattle if you want to test. Um, we don't need to run these things, you know, in house and not tell anybody. Uh, you you can approach people that have stacks that, that are open source or otherwise, and, and start the remote interrupt now. You'll um, be happier when you arrive in Seattle if you do that. Okay. Any other agenda bashing? Okay. So let's go on. The second implementation draft. Martin Duke. Yeah, Martin updated this uh, for us overnight. Remote attendance is great. It is. <laughs> they work while you sleep or not. And then they don't sleep while you work. <laughs> Do you want to? I, I did. Okay, Martin, go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, again. Um, I know you're starting a day, I'm at the end of a long day, but uh, so I tried to internalize the, um, a lot of the comments from, uh, I tried to synthesize the comments from the minutes about this. Uh, I thought there was pretty strong convergence around, um, around the first option, which is the one that really mostly emphasized getting the, the wire image and the handshake right and really Cleaning up some of the remaining issues there, uh, to to knock to lock that down, and also, well, it doesn't. Uh, there, I use that word again, <laughs> not lock it down, but to at least converge closer to a to a final solution for this that um, prevents a middle box from ossifying on the wrong sort of thing. So I think um, it, it actually may be best to go backwards through this, uh, Mark. So can you just scroll down to the bottom? So the things that I didn't hear real any really any um, movement in term any real uh, enthusiasm for addressing, um, or at least not sufficient enthusiasm, were the the five things you see listed there. Um, loss recovery is a very and congestion control, of course, very important mechanisms, but they are also um, concepts that have been tested in TCP, and they are not, in the pure sense, interoperability issues. Um, then the, the next tier is things where I thought there was really mixed feedback. There was a comment um, about bringing PMT discovery. Having worked on that section a lot, I'm not really sure I follow why that's urgent. And then the other one that was very interesting was zero RTT and resumption. Um, there was broad consensus that it was a really tough and tricky problem and people drew opposite conclusions from that. One was that it was too tough and tricky to take on and it could sink the second implementation. And the other conclusion was that um, it was really tough and tricky and so we needed to tackle it right away. And then if you could scroll up, Mark, please. Uh, and then beyond just sort of basic stream mechanisms and so on, um, I thought we converged around a relatively simple application, simple than HP2, so you don't have to bring in all that weight uh, at this point. Uh, Ian did ask to have it be multi-stream, so I just sort of tweaked the the spec here to say that it would be a simple echo application, maybe used it more than one stream. Um, and then finally, uh, there was some pushback about flow control and, and and that we needed something to, that flow control is again, sort of tricky to get right, um, but that we needed something to prevent people from just sending stuff out at line rate. Um, I still think that using flow control rather than congest control uh, is probably gonna be a little simpler for this iteration. And I am happy to not, to just have the basic mechanism where you set pretty coarse limits on this stuff. And the, the real objective here is just to make sure that peers are observing those limits. Um, so that's basically what's changed since yesterday. Um, 
feel free to now shoot at that. All right, Martin Thompson. Um, first thing, I think we should probably just can the go away aspect on this one. I don't think there's any point in, in doing that. We we haven't really resolved the mm. the open issues on that, and I would rather just see us not implement that. It's something that's very easy to cut. So, so just chop that. Just chop that out. Yeah. Um, uh, on Jabber yesterday, I suggested we do HTTP 0 0.9, <laughs> um, which might actually which might actually fit reasonably well with some people's expectations of how the echo works, which is you just, uh, with a get, you know, get X, and then you get the some thing back. It doesn't really matter what it is. And then you close the stream. And then you close the stream. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's, I think it's the simplest possible thing. Um, you have to you have to like look for get that, and if you don't, you can fail and whatever else. Um, I think that's pretty reasonable. You do string matching, basically. If I get this string, I'm gonna send this, this, this content. Uh, I think that would be a pretty reasonable way of doing it, and I think that's um, it's already spec'd. Um, otherwise, I think this is this is pretty reasonable. Uh, let's leave the debatable stuff out, and <clears throat> as with the previous draft, if you implement more than what was specified in the sort of we agreed to do this, that's cool. Um, Janai Engar, I agree with what Martin just said. Maybe we restrict it. We don't say HTTP 0.9, but just get, because that seems enough for us to be doing this testing. Um, the, yeah, well, and we don't need to support all the primitives. Is all I'm saying. Um, the uh, two two thoughts. One, uh, a simple multi-streamed application. I'll note that between crypto stream and whatever stream we are sending data on, we already have two streams, so maybe it's already multi-streamed. Um, so it's, it's, I'd, I'd be fine with not requiring multi-streamed application because HTTP.9 is not multi-streamed. So if you want to make it multi-streamed, now you have to think about exactly what we're. So, so you can multiplex multiple requests, right? I think that would be, be pretty reasonable. OK, fair enough. Um, what is stateless reset? Yeah, I haven't. I think it's public reset. Uh, public reset. I'm going to uh, recognize Martin because I think he wants to respond to that. Yeah, sorry about that. That I I, I thought we changed the term from stateless to public reset, um, or, 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 or reverse that from public to stateless reset, um, and that seems to be confusing everybody. So maybe that's a indicator. Um, on the multi-streamed application bit, um, uh, or the point about multi-streamed applications. Uh, I think this is related to a point that Ian made yesterday, which was that we can't really um, exercise stream versus connection flow control if we have only one stream subject to flow control, because stream zero, as I understand it, is not open to it. Great. Hi, Brian Trammell. Um, as the person whose name is on there to like um, volunteer to write up a non-specified thing, I think it's great if we choose a specified thing. Um, so, and I think that, yeah, so I actually came up to, to ask the clarification question that Martin already answered, or how are we going to multi-stream this? And basically HP09 get uh, multiplexed seems perfect. So yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Uh, I am also in support of Martin's suggestion of both remove and go away and, uh, HP.9 with get. This is DKG. I just wanted to put out to the room that if you really want a, a multi-stream protocol, you could just do FTP. <laughs> For the record, there was a boo in the room. Yeah, this seems like, Eric Scroll, this seems like a pretty reasonable uh, list of things. I, I, I do think we should do multiplexed get, though, not just assume that crypto and everything else are, are, are parallel. Okay. All right. So um, just, just for the record, uh, resumption and zero TT are fairly different, and resumption is easy, and zero TT is harder. And so, um, that that I don't know what direction that pushes you in, but it like it wouldn't be hard to do resumption here, but zero TT does take more work. Okay. There's a plus one from Mike Bishop in Java for HTTP zero dot nine. Okay. So Martin, do you have enough information to do a few more tweaks, and then we'll take it to the list? I certainly can. Um, uh, I didn't really get any 
yeas or nays on the two debatable items, but I think uh, I think we're converging on all the things we're actually going to include in this. I mean, the the first set of of items there. It's okay, Martin. We we heard from Martin that uh, he thinks we should drop those, and uh, several people agreed, and several people indeed are agreeing in the room right now. Okay, great. Then yeah, you'll see something without any uh, uncertainty in it, and then we can iterate from there. Thanks. And thank you so much, Martin. Okay, um, that takes us on to quick invariance. Martin Thompson, I will queue up your presentation. You know what? Uh, Martin, has this been updated any time recently? Okay, then I have the most recent. Um, you haven't? Updated since you changed it, or you sent it. <laughs> okay. Uh, why is it not in my repo? Hi, my name is Martin Thompson. It has been. It, 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 it has been, um, I'm trying to count, uh, less than three minutes since I last spoke in a microphone. I'm just going to stand here until these guys sort this out because we're not going anywhere without oh, my notes and they're on the screen. <laughs> no, it's called handshake here, Martin. That's what's confusing me. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, because that's what I'm looking for. I don't care about the rest of the things. Um, so um, part of the reason why I wanted to have this discussion here was that um, it was in anticipation of people actually implementing the handshake. And it seems we have at least a little bit of experience with that. So next, please. All right. So um, I'm talking about attacks. Um, before we have a handshake complete, uh, the thesis here is that it's very easy to prevent the handshake from completing. There's very, any number of things that can go wrong, and any one of them can go wrong, and then you don't have a handshake and you don't have key exchange. And the question here is what, if anything, do we want to do about this? What mechanisms do we want to build to make sure that someone can't interfere with the actual handshake completing? So there's a meta issue here. You can follow that if you like. Next slide, please. Uh, they are in the repo, and they should be uploaded. I, if not, I'll, let me make sure they're also on the data tracker. I thought we had them there, but yeah, they're, they're certainly in the quick working group materials. Um, so um, this is a decision point that I think we need to have. Um, can we agree on this? That is, during the handshake. The IP address on one side and the IP address on the other side and the port numbers that we use um, won't be changing. Now, we sort of assume this currently. It does not work at the moment if um, a client receives a packet from a random IP address. I don't believe. Um, that's physics. If you send a packet and it comes and the response comes back on a different source IP, it's not going to get through your NAT. Um, and we, we sort of have any, and if it comes back to a different IP address or port, well, it's probably not going to get to you. So um, I think this is what we are assuming at the moment. And if anyone disagrees with that, I'd like to have them speak now. Thanks, Abode. <laughs> <laughs> I can always rely on you, Matt. <laughs> it's about anger. Um, so one. Uh, point of clarification is uh, what the scope of the handshake really is here. Is it until version negotiation is complete? Or is it that the zero RTD is done? No, it's until the handshake is complete. And that is until you have the shared keys. Um, so the not, um, pa perhaps we should clarify that to not include the client's second flight um, because that's but, but it may because that's that's really just sort of signaling at that point. Um, but up until, well, 
there's, there's some challenges in, in, in that as well. I think perhaps what we, what we might do most cleanly is to say the point at which you start packet protecting with one RTT keys is the point the handshake is done. So uh, there's a point before that as well in the current version. This was true in the previous version of the draft. In the current version of the draft, uh, the client will choose the server chosen connection ID in the second flight in the finish message. In the, yes. That is the client clear text packet. Yes. So uh, we could now allow uh, the IP address source IP to change after that. Like as soon, so should we redefine this as more that uh, when the for client that packet? Yes, you could, um, and that's why I think we might need you know, maybe a little bit of hand waving is, is necessary, but I think that that's the only one that yeah. Fits that so I'm just suggesting a change of language to be that until the server chosen connection ID is available for the client, the client cannot change the source IP address. That'd work too. Um, there's some there's some other things here that I, I think we'll be using the handshake as complete rather than that particular one, but that's fine. I was I was looking to simplify a little bit, and we can make that point. Uh, next slide, please. Um, space, right? All right. So um, let's talk about what it is that someone can do to prevent the handshake from completing. So. Um, if you're on path and you're able to see and modify packets as they transit, you can block them. Sorry, Martin. Um, Martin Duke wants to ask a question. Oh, Martin Duke. Uh, one clarification. Sorry. Oops. One clarification yeah. on the on the previous pa uh, slide. Um, so, is is that limitation? Is that security limitation, or is that has something to do with the SCID assignment? But I think I can't change the address. Uh, yeah. Connection, yeah, as Subod pointed out, it's connection ID um, arrangement. When the negotiation you, you go through to get a connection ID. And I don't like to use the word negotiation here because it's not really a negotiation. But yes. Well, because I mean, in principle, because if that's the issue, in principle, if the client maintained, it had multiple IP addresses but maintained a consistent client um, or, or a consistent client connection ID, then really you just have to associate that those two connection IDs as a server. You need to know what the client was using and what you proposed and sort of track that transition. OK. Um, we're not precluding anyone being clever, but um, I think we have to take some steps to simplify this. Yeah. Fair Unfortunately, enough. Martin. OK. All right. Uh, you clarified. No, just uh, Martin. Um, that really does like, create a whole host of complications uh, about like off path attackers and then like redirecting you like during the handshake or like right after the handshake and then uh, it it's possible they're all solvable but like I think in the interest of making forward progress on the transport it would be awesome to agree on this now and if we think like there are constraints that this is imposing that are like really costly to applications we like fix them like right right yeah okay thank you I'm gonna assume that that's agreed and we'll move on um, so if you're on path, you can modify Wait. a delay, break. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, it? one interrupt. Um, I just hit an operational issue I'd need to take care of, and I was trying to take bad minutes. I need somebody else to take over. I'm sorry. OK. Can we have a volunteer for a scribe, please? You're in the etherpad, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. So if you're on path, I I'm suggesting we don't worry about that because we can't stop someone from messing with things. It's actually pretty easy to modify a client hello in ways that would be very difficult to de detect. Um, you'll detect it later on when the handshake fails, but nothing else. Um, but the question that we have here is what about attackers that are off path? Maybe they can see packets. Um, maybe they can spoof packets. Next, next slide. So the standard defense here is have the recipient of a packet prove that they received a packet from you. And in TCP, we rely on echoing the sequence number. In STUN, we have a transaction ID for that. Um, we actually have some more entropy than that in practice. Uh, but in QUIC, 
Well, hmm. next slide. So version negotiation echoes the packet number and connection ID. Uh, the server stateless retry does the same thing. Uh, after a version negotiation, the client initial doesn't actually contain a proof, and I don't think we actually need one because it's effectively like starting over. The client doesn't really assume that there's any, uh, the server doesn't really assume anything about the client when it receives another one of these things. Um, you can actually put a cookie in the server stateless retry, and that's kind of several layers in, but you can put that cookie in, and when the client sends another client initial with a, with a client hello in it, uh, that will contain a cookie, and you can sort of do some verification that it was the same one. That allows you to do the um, source address validation. That's kind of the, the, the fundamental basis of that. Um, the interesting one here is that the server plain text might include an act frame. Um, and that's actually something that we're not concrete on because we, we have the situation where acknowledgements aren't necessarily present in every single uh, quick packet. And the server plain text is actually multiple packets. And some of them will contain um, an act frame and some of them will not. And so when the client receives one of these things, um, there is maybe a packet, maybe the packet number of the packet that it, its initial client hello, and maybe not. Ian. Uh, one comment about that is, uh, though the GQuick code is not perfect, doesn't do this all the time, it attempts to always include an act frame. Uh, I believe with the equivalent of the server plain text. And the reason is to, as much as possible, not require, not rely on the crypto state machine to poke into the transport state machine and say, well, I've gone forward secure, so like nuke all this crap. Like it's really nice to actually have the transport layer as, I mean, otherwise you have yeah. to do a bunch of optimizations. It's still valid, but like right. it's really nice right. to actually, if you can require that, it's great, I guess I'm saying. Uh, and, and yes, we, we could require that, and then the zero goes away, and we only have the, we have the 31. Don't, don't sit down, Nint. No, don't sit down. So, I mean, one thing which we should discuss for the future is exactly the point you just raised, namely, I send a client initial, and I get the server, if the server hello, um, should I just assume that implicitly acts the client initial? Actor, can you speak into the mic, please? Sorry. Should I assume that just implicitly acts the client initial, or should I be continuing to retransfer the client initial, even though I have, like, Definitive proof that's been received. That is a good question, and I'm hoping the answer to that might be clear after Martin finishes his presentation. But I fear the answer is not. But I, yeah. I would prefer the answer is no, but if we, like, I'm pretty sure we do that in GQuick today just because we, oh, I'm pretty sure we do that in Google Quick today just because it's the server plain text typically includes an app frame and occasionally does not, and mumble mumble, like, we basically want to clean crap up and like move forward. Um, but it's not ideal. We don't really like it. Christian Wittema from uh, testing state machines like that in prototypes. Things get much easier if we do mandate that the server plain text acknowledges the previous packets. That is, that is true. Um, and we can certainly make that requirement. So, um, the other thing to observe here is that the client plain text, um, in addition to also probably maybe including an ACK, um, although there's some text in there that sort of suggests that maybe you want to defer that so you can authenticate it. Um, it contains TLS ciphertext and you can, you can actually use that to, to implicitly, the server can use that to, to verify that this is actually part of the same handshake that they were continuing. Um, that crosses the layers again. And this is another another point. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, this whole on path, off path attack thing is something that I consider to be a responsibility of the transport. <laughs> and it's getting handed off in various ways. And it's inconsistent and not very clear. So next slide. So. Um, Here's, I think, the options that we have if anyone wants to come up with a different one. Um, we can discuss that here. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time discussing the, the relative merits of these. Um, so um, Mikkel on, on GitHub proposed uh, at various points um, the idea that we have separate connection IDs for peers and we have essentially have two connection IDs, one, one controlled by one end, one controlled by the other end, and you actually echo them in both directions. Um, that, in addition to providing additional identification, 
um, you would have the ability then to use those for this sort of on-path, off-path verification. Christian. Christian Rietemau. The uh, practical threat that I'm really concerned about is the man on the side. Right. And on the man on the side case, we have to assume that the man on the side have seen the content of the client hello. So uh, the, the only actual security that we can get is that if we do involve a key. And the defense against the man on the side has to be something like do your connection, do your handshake on a secure channel somewhere, and then we use that on your on set network. Yeah. So the the, so it's, the the observation there is that the, if the man on the side can can race your um, genuine handshake packets because they've seen the other ones, they can certainly cause damage. And without a key, without a key, you can't really do anything about that. Uh, I mean, I think Ecker's selection uh, suggestion seems totally reasonable. I, as said on the issues, kind of want to thread, change the, um, the hash again anyway, because now I'm super concerned about ossification of our handshake. Um, I would prefer anything that encrypts it um, based on both connection ID and some version number or something, some other, some other nonce that basically makes it um, a hassle for middle so, boxes unless they upgrade frequently. So I, your suggestion was um, actually encrypt this, but with a, effectively with a fixed key? Uh, a fixed key per version, basically. Per, version. Per, per, per quick version per connection ID. Sounds, is, that's approximately my... Interesting. Well, I, I think, maybe I'm just restating what I think Ian said, but let me put something extremely concrete, which is that the client, the client offered connection ID is used to encipher, is used as the cryptographic key for, for otherwise bog standard AES GCM um, or AAD protection, if you want to pick cha cha or something, I suppose I could live with that, of the packet. So it's always the same transform. Right. And it's just and just prior to handshake completion, it's key with the connection ID or something HKDF not the connection ID. Yeah. And and to Christian's point, if you can see that connection ID, you can break this thing and it's and yeah, you'll be able to read it. Um, that but, makes inspection of the contents of the handshake messages difficult for a middle box, but not impossible. But actually I want to add that I, I still do want it to be a function of the quick version, because I want the property that as quick moves forward. If say I do a version bump and we end up with TLS 1.4, uh, that in order to see inside the handshake packets, you actually have to upgrade your middle box to see uh, the SNI and all that stuff. So because I have a otherwise, suggestion. okay. Suggestion would be we 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 roll the dice and come up with a key that we put in the spec, um, and we take the connection ID and the now we work it out. Yep. Sure, I don't care about the details. I yep. just want that feature, and we. Do it. Uh, Jana Angar, I, I do have a concern with this. Um, we've talked about this in the past, and we decided not to use uh, ASGCM for plain text packets because one of the reasons was because we would not be able to deprecate it ever. Um, we'd be stuck with this for the rest of our lives, and that's a concern that still exists. Not, not, not with Ian's suggestion. So with Ian's suggestion, it would be version specific, the transform that's being used. And so, and so if we decide that we want to use uh, so 13 for the next version of Quick, then that would be perfectly clear. This is for all clear text packets, right, including the client hello, the client initial? So sure. if I see the Why client not? initial and I don't know what version it is, how am I going to decrypt it? The version's in the header. So we would, be, we would protect exactly the same way as we would protect any other packet. It's just that we would have a fixed cipher and a fixed key, effectively. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yes, I think that that works. Right. So not to be arguing against interest, but um, there is an implication of this, which is that you will be unable to validate the not the 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 quick validity at all of these packets unless you speak unless you have AES. So. Um, um, so that, that's the implication right. of that. Yes. Is they will just lock it, like you will not be able to distinguish random nonsense. If you don't speak that version, you will know, distinguish random nonsense from. Uh, um, there, there will be signal in the version field. Okay. So you'll be able to look at the version field and, and guess that maybe this might be quick, but there's not a lot of signal. There, there's could not I, a strong signal. Yeah, that we yeah. designed this offline because you're rapidly running out of time. 
for your okay, presentation. Okay, sure, um, sure, sure. I'm, ha I'm happy to send a, a concrete proposal based on things I, things I just heard. That'd be great. Which you can then yep. debate. Yep. If people think this is approximately right, or at least right enough to want to see your proposal, I'm happy to spend the work on it. Right. And so um, just, just to put a, try to put a pin in this one, um, Christian, go and I'll try to summar summarize. Well, I mean, uh, um, the proposal is, is fine. I would insist that we do it, uh, that we specify clearly whether we do that for the second implementation or not. Correct. Yes, we will. We will make that very, very because, clear. Thank because, you very much. Because it's it's going to make uh, the uh, interop interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Yes, uh, we we found that FNV one A, despite its simplicity, was not actually something that everyone agreed on. Really? There were there were quite a number of problems with that. Um, which is an interesting thing that we kind of missed in the report yesterday. So um, the advantage of doing this is that for all the clear text packets, we'll have some proof that this is part of the, the original connection and you will have to be effectively able to see the, the initial client packet in order to generate a valid packet that will be accepted by anyone for the, on, on the handshake. That's great, thank you, next slide. Um, right, a badly formed frame is a connection error. Uh, but if there's no handshake, uh, if the handshake hasn't completed, ooh, are you sure that it's actually from the other guy or is it from an attacker trying to break your connection? So the question is, do we ignore malformed packets um, and whether do we actually kill the connection as a result of various problems that we have during the handshake? Next. So here's my principles. Next, please. Uh, okay, so we have an example here. It's version negotiation. We can skip this one. Okay, so um, the idea here is um, I'm going to suggest that we rely on the defense we have against off-path attackers. Uh, we accept that disruption of the handshake is possible if you can see the packets and inject them. And uh, if we want to and we're doing resumption, uh, we can add extra defense later. Not now. I don't think that we, I'm interested in, in having a, another design team on what is essentially a corner case. Janai Angar, I agree with this this path forward. Um, we have thought about we for Google Quick at least we thought about this quite a while, and, and I um, basically allow for connection close packets to be received at this point uh, in 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 plain text. That's what happens, and yeah, it's yep. not a trivial problem to solve. Yep. Okay. Um, if there's no objections, I think we'll move on. All right. So what happens if the handshake fails? Um, how do we actually signal this? Um, so <coughs> prior to sending server clear text, the server hasn't committed any state. Um, maybe this, maybe you can just sort of ignore what, anything that looks bad. Um, and prior to the client receiving that, the client doesn't know if the server has committed any state. So think about those things when we go into the next slide. And uh, we mandate currently virtually all of these things for error ca cases. So in some cases, we send a version negotiation packet. Sometimes we ignore things. Sometimes we drop the, connect, the, the connection silently. For instance, if it's particular client initial packets, we basically treat them as internet chaff and, and ignore them. Uh, sometimes we send a connection close in the clear, or we could, but the draft prohibits it. Um, and it also mandates that we send TLS alerts, um, but we don't really say where. So there's a bunch of things that we need to clean up in, the, in this respect. Next slide, please. Uh, this reference next. Um, so there's a bunch of things that can go wrong before the handshake completes. I think this is not exhaustive, but it's pretty pretty close to what we have. Um, and I want to go through this list and, and apply a set of principles rather than go through each one of them and make a decision. So next slide. So here's my proposed set of principles for which we'll go through this. I want agreement on these principles so that John and I can go back and actually apply those principles. Um, so my, my rules are, if it looks like it's going to move your state forward, and it does, we're good. If it's redundant because it looks like a, a retransmission of something, so it's a version negotiation that contains the, the version that you picked, just drop it, move on, that's fine. Maybe you can fire some spurious retransmit machinery if you want to keep tracking these things, whatever. Do what, just basically the, the draft will require that you just, just ignore it. Clarification question. When you say use connection close if you can, are you actually talking about using that in uh, clear text? No? Yes. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. So if it contains an error, if it looks good but it's broken in some way, 
send a connection close, give up. In the clear, doesn't matter. Um, and if it's a TLS error and it's generated an alert, shove that in a stream frame and, and, and shuffle it across because that's useful information for the other side and they can diagnose that. So, but, so, but anger. Um, so by redundant, do you mean the, the packet number has been sent again? Like you got to do yeah, packets, it, two well, it's, it's not going to be the same packet number, but it's going to be the same content. So if you receive the string frame that, for, for data that you've already, already got, it's just a, a, a retransmission, right? So if you receive a second client hello, as people discovered in, in, the, in the hackathon, um, people were retransmitting client hellos before the server hello arrived even on local host. I don't know how that actually <laughs> managed to happen. Um, but um, this happens, you receive two client hellos. If you've processed the first one and sent out the response, just ignore the second one, that's fine. Uh, right, I'm, I'm wondering more of this is the packet layer, or this is a stream layer. That, that seems like more of a stream layer question, right? Like versus a this is, connection This is, this is a, a, an expression of principles because it, it operates at all those levels. But version negotiation is one of these examples. Yes, so yeah, was just, that's what I got up to say, Jana Ingar, that yeah, this applies across the board because version negotiation is one of those things which we currently actually ignore and that falls under that principle. And the, and the, st the stateless retry is another one that, that also falls into that category. You receive, you, you send two client initials, you get back two stateless retries, just one of them use and the other one throw away. So just to make sure I understand these principles, I wish to attempt to apply them in one case. Say I re receive a second apparent client initial that contains different contents or is longer or shorter than the first client initial. I simply ignore that? Sure. Um, so longer is actually quite interesting. Shorter is less interesting. Um, uh, um, yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Because it's apparently data on stream zero that is, that is extending. You know, I mean? <laughs> yes. Uh, Jana Engar, I think at the moment we actually require exactly one client initial. So uh, I suspect, I don't, I'm, I'm no, not but sure, you, but it no, probably but would be a protocol. You, you, re you rebuild a cl client initial, and if someone's got a bug in their code, where they're actually, they're actually rebuilding the client initial. Ah, uh, that's what you mean. Okay. Then, then you you might end up with two or two different ones. Well, the duplicate client initial is also a signature of a man on the side attack. That is that is the point that I think we need to consider in this case. So I would say that maybe, yeah, you don't know if you receive two of those messages, and the same goes for the server plain text. You don't know whether what you receive is a spoof by a bad guy or, or a duplicate or, or some hiccup of the client. So, can we so, back to so previous? At, at the minimum, you, you want to have some kind of logging that these things yes. are happening, right. and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But, but in terms of principles, I think the, the, um, the rule here would be, um, particularly for Ecker's case, where there are different lengths and different contents, if you can detect that, fail, would be the, the application of the principle there. But I, I wouldn't insist that people detect that. I mean, the retransmitted client hello should have the same stream zero data. Should it might have a different yeah. packet number. Different packet um, number, yes. Exactly. So that case, you can actually distinguish, um, which is the, you know, but, yeah. but the other cases, when, when somebody regenerates the client hello, erroneously, then you it, it looks like an attack signature. Well, yeah. Lars, what will hap <coughs> happen in the case you cited, you will receive two frames that purport to send data at the beginning of stream zero with different lengths. And so if you just apply the current mechanism, like what, what the case that Ika was mentioning, you receive a first client hello that has 100 bytes, and a second one that has 110 yeah. bytes, the, the standard behavior is to put another 10 byte at the end of stream zero. I, I agree. What I'm saying is the case we are doing the interrupt is a retransmitted client hello that basically had the exact same stream zero data as the first one. Yep. And that's a, that's a valid retransmit and that, that yes. should be safe oh. to ignore because it, the, the stream zero data is exactly what you got them before. We have a principle already for this one. Um, so uh, the current draft talks about the possibility that you can receive different values for a given byte on a stream. And it says that you may, if you if you like, detect this thing and treat it as a connection error. Yes. And if the length of a client hello changes, that's a change in the byte that has a, there's a length field in there that will be changing the stream no, if data. The, if the first, if the second strictly extends the first, if the if there's it no will bytes be, it will, but the no, no, no it, it cannot. Okay, it cannot. 
Um, and be valid at the same uh, time. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, well, yes and no. Right. Um, so bear in mind, the client hello is just in a stream frame. So I receive a client initial with a stream frame that is longer, that is a properly formatted client hello, plus say a, oh, a yeah. properly unformatted, yeah. um, you know, TLS record for, um, for, for, cl for client finished, right? Which um, is garbage at the end. Right, I mean, so I think, I think that the, the, there, are, there are two principles we can imagine applying here. One principle is just drive the state machine forward using the not the nominal like reassembly principles you'd ordinarily apply. And in this case, um, as Christian says, either it's a senior the man on the side, or you're talking to Mink. It doesn't matter which one. But um, you um, you know you end up with two, two copies, and you just uh, you know and and if if they are screwed in this way, you, you end up with that extra data being prepended to the server finished and to the client finished, and the connection eventually fails. Um, so that would be the nominal behavior. The other behavior we could imagine applying, which would be say be in this particular case, be extraordinarily aggressive about double checking for anomalies and attempt to recover from them. I think that will be a and so the way you handle this is you would discard that second client hello as bogus. Um, yep. special, um, rule for, for special, client special, special, special rule for special rule for client initial. Um, um, I think it's probably not worth doing. Um, um, I mean, it's it happens to be very convenient for me because I process client initials totally separately from everything else. But I think in general, that's like not a, not a great rule to have. So I think I I think until and I think probably it won't do a very good job of fixing the problem anyway. So I propose we just say ordinary processing applies here. And because the man is like, I can just as well send you a packet which appears to be a, a client plain text and contains bogus garbage for the for the finished. Yeah, I'm going to jump to Martin in uh, the remote queue. Yes, can you please clarify what the difference is between a packet that is in error and is in clearly bad, and also what the asterisk means at the end of ignore it? So I think we close that one. The client initial. Sorry. Clarify which one? Oh, the start. Um, yeah. So that there was some notes on the on the slide, um, and I think the client initial was one of those things. Um, uh, there's the length thing as well that I wanted to mention. Um, if a client initial comes in and it's only 1,100 octets long, that one's one that we just throw on the floor anyway. Um, things like that. I didn't okay. have enough room on the slide to do this, and I can't remember exactly what I wrote down. All right, let, let's try and, and uh, let, let's close the queue, I think, because we do yeah. need to get on to the next topic. Are these the right principles is what I, what I want to get yeah. to. I'll be really quick. Um, if I understand correctly what, what Eker said, I actually prefer that we have a special case for the client initial, just because um, the way that the stream reassembly would work, we don't actually, we don't actually say exactly which copy of data should be uh, delivered to the application. If the, if the transport receives the first copy and then the second copy, and they're different at stream offset zero, we don't specify what happens at this point. Undefined behavior, yeah. I'm, right. I think that's so, where we're at. Yeah. Right. You, you can generate an error, and it does sort of encourage we that. We actually did have, that so that was an error I had proposed a while ago, because yeah. there was a stream overlapped error, if you remember, that, that we removed. Yeah. Um, and that actually was to check and see if, if we received I was proposed what? that we check to see if the data that we received, if it overlaps and is different from what we already buffered, then you spit that error out. But we can talk about this. Yeah, so, no, I don't, so, yeah, I don't think we should go there. Yeah. Um, so the the conclusion there, I thought, was that you we used to have a you must check, and that was going to be particularly onerous. Uh, yeah. No, I don't think we should do this. Yeah, which is why I'm which is why I'm proposing that we special case the client and special case this. Yeah. That'd be fine. I think that you, you had a first principle that said that we accept that the clear text part of the exchange is not protected. Okay, and that means that if people play games like uh, inserting data on stream zero by various firm, etc., that's too bad. It's as long as we don't have a, a key negotiated, we cannot protect against that, and we accept it, and that's it. Yeah. All right, I'm done. You Thank guys you. have the information you need. I have the information I need, which is good. Thank you, John. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, we have unidirectional streams, and then we have three presentations. If we want to get to those three presentations, we need to finish up unidirectional streams by about 10:55. So when we get to that, yeah, that, that's totally achievable. Uh, I guess when it comes to 10:55, we'll, we'll we'll stop and assess where we're at.
Uh, Ian. While Ian's coming up, does anyone else need the blue sheets? Raise your hands. Nice and high. Cool. Given how yesterday went, I have high expectations. Um, <laughs> uh, unidirectional and bidirectional streams. So there's been a fair amount of discussion in the last about month on various like kind of streaming models that we might apply to Quick. So next slide. Um, background. Uh, Quick needs to support HTTP is in the charter. Uh, HTTP2 supports both request response and server push. Uh, server push essentially only sends data in one direction. It does not actually send any data in the reverse direction from client to server. So uh, the transport and application doc combined need to support both bidirectional streams and unidirectional streams. So on a high level, there are two ways to get there. Next slide. Uh, use only one direction of a bidirectional stream. There are kind of two different ways, or maybe three different ways, depending on your perspective, of how one might accomplish that or build bidirectional streams on top of two unidirectional streams. Cool, let's go. Uh, the current draft uh, describes pairs of uh, incoming and outgoing streams, think TCP. It's a, it's a very standard you know, bidirectional streaming model. Uh, it's pretty ideal for HTTP requests and responses. I mean, it obviously fits fairly well with most request response protocols. Uh, we have a bunch of deployment experience with it. It seems to largely work. Uh, the cons right now are requires sending an unnecessary stream frame with a fin for server push. Um, at least in the context of HTTP, that's kind of the main, the main con. So, yeah, Martin Thompson. Um, there were a couple of bugs that I went through in the presentation in Paris. Um, okay, they, you put issues down there, but then you didn't add any issues, so I, I didn't I, know what they. I, I, I dropped the ball on that one, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, I had to look them up and we've got like 7,000 of them, so. Okay, yeah. that's fair. I, I, I noticed that they were there and I was wondering, I was like, oh, I wonder if he's gonna add these, but no, okay. So, okay, so apparently there are some open issues. I, I do not know what they are. Uh, next, uh, bidirectional. So this is actually what Google Quick does today, apparently. I didn't know this before this whole discussion came up. Uh, and we do bidirectional streams, but instead of send, bothering to send the fin, we just close it. We're just like, mm, I know how server push works from the application layer. I'm just gonna like shut this half down. Uh, this is ideal for HTTP. It works really well. Like you don't require any unnecessary state management. Uh, it requires a potential layer violation um, on the negative side, as you depending on your perspective. And you can't tell uh, from the transport state exactly what's going on. So if you're looking at it on the wire, and you were trying to just terminate quick as a transport, you would have no idea that like the stream is already half closed unless you knew how the application mapping worked. Um, but I mean, this does work fine, but it's a little bit unseemly. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a proposal to allow you to open streams half closed, uh, adds a bit in the stream frame to indicate this is going to be a half closed stream. Um, it saves you sending an unnecessary fin, uh, for server push, uh, it's a relatively small change to the existing draft. Um, uses a bit in the type byte on the negative side. Adds some transport complexity, particularly around implicitly open streams. It's possible this requires an extra state just to explicitly deal with that. Um, and we don't have any actual deployment experience with this, as is true of the next two as well. So this is essentially an optimization, I probably should say as a high level, this is essentially an optimization on top of the bi-directional model to just say, you know, I don't really like the non-explicit close of the Google Quick approach, and I also don't really want to deal with sending an extra, like, thin bit in this new frame. Um, just a clarification point, Chennai Ingar. There was actually, early in the earlier drafts, uh, or at least in the input draft, we did have in the uh, stream uh, state machine, there was the application close on both sides, which was the transition used to implement um, Google Quick's unidirectionality uh, function. And I also just wanted to clarify that the difference between the unidirectional stream case, uh, sorry, the the um, the Google Quick case and the do nothing bidirectional case is that in the bidirectional case, we'll actually be sending a fin, whereas in Google Quick, we just don't send one fin. That's what it is, yes. 
so the new proposal uh, is all streams are unidirectional. Uh, you pair two of them together to create a, your own bidirectional stream if you need to at the transport, at the application layer, not the transport layer, sorry. So at the transport doc, uh, you only have unidirectional streams. Uh, for example, you can create a bidirectional stream from five and five, or you can create it from like five and 18. Like, so it's, especially uh, in the presence of mixing unidirectional streams and bidirectional streams, it's very reasonable to assume that like the IDs would not line up, but they may. Depends on the application mounting. All right, next slide. Ian, clarification question. Um, is there a difference between two unidirectional streams and a cur currently current bidirectional stream? Because I, I think it's confusing. I, I like calling them pairs if there's no difference. I, I guess that was kind of one of the points of this slide is that they, they need not be paired. They can be paired so, in arbitrary ways and no, you need to create an associated. And, and, and that's fine, right? Them. Because it's just the same number or not. Um, but but I so so anyway, let me let me rephrase that and <laughs> let's go to Martin. Uh, so, I don't want to confuse. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to I clarify want to my clarification question in my head and I'm going to ask it again. Okay. Yeah. So so Ian, I think I can help you. Okay. So the I think one of the the fundamental differences between saying I've got a unidirectional stream and another uni, unidirectional stream paired is that at some point in time, depending on your on your interaction patterns, uh, in the pairing case you don't have state that bridges the two of them together. And so if you have the, if you have the bidirectional streams um, and you look at a typical HTTP interaction where you have a small get request, the transmission of the request completes, but you still have the state associated with that stream even though you, you have no ongoing transmission for that thing. You have state at that point. And in the, in the unidirectional stream where you sort of stitch the two unidirectional streams together, at the transport layer, you have the get request go out as one stream and then it disappears and you have no streams. Right. right. And then later on the response comes in and you have a stream again. And so there's, there's nothing at the transport layer that bridges the, the, the state between those two things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Modulo loss. Modulo loss and overlapping and all those sorts of other things that we right. do, right? There's a lot of right. cases where the, a, a request comes in and the response is going out at the same time and it's all down but, to whether or not um, your perspective on things as to whether or not um, those things are concurrent or not. Concurrent right. or not. But the transport doesn't. Yeah. So, so yeah, so the key thing here is it's in the transport doc there are only unidirectional streams and if you want bidirectional streams or any other pairing options, which may be more complex, such as the original HTTP2 mapping, you need to build that at the application layer. That's the key idea. Right. Yeah, that may be, maybe the right way to summarize this is a BYOB. <laughs> is it BYOM? Bring your own Bring your bidirectional. Own That's a nice B B BYO bidirectionality, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Next slide. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. Okay. Um, so this simplifies the transport doc, uh, definitely simplifies server push, uh, makes the HTTP mapping document more complex. Um, each application needs to implement request response mapping if it ha needs that. Um, and there's kind of a weird quirk around max stream limits where you can potentially get in a case you can send a request and not get a response. Uh, I mean, it's up to the application implementation to like make sure that doesn't happen, but it's a possibility. It's kind of a weird edge case. Yeah. So Martin Thompson, it's also unclear as to whether it's actually a con. Um, as <laughs> that's, in, but I, that's a fair point. Right. So but it you, might it just be that we're, we're cool with this and we wanted to send all these pushes and you know, you were, you were sending me requests? Don't care. Yeah. Right? So that's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little bit odd, but that, that's I think the, the only observation you can really make. That's fair. It's yeah. certainly odd, but uh, you're right. It, it may or may not be a con. Uh, I only have like one more slide. Do you want me to get through them? Can, can we let them? Sure. Thanks. Okay. okay. Next. Oh, no, can wait. A back one. Just a clarification question oh, on the previous slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the repo. It is actually. You also can't upload it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you want me to swap out? Is it yeah, important? Yeah, yeah, Martin would like you to stop, swap out. Okay, hold on a second then. Uh, Go, Jana. I have a clarification because on the previous slide, you you said there's no uh, it, 
it says there's no deployment experience. Uh, my understanding at the moment is there's no implementation experience. Is that incorrect? Um, yeah, so um, I, I probably should have said implementation or deployment. I don't think any of the last three have implementation. Or yeah, so um, there is no deployment experience in Quick, obviously, because the, like, we virtually have no deployment experience with like any of this stuff. Um, you guys have uh, the second one that Ian presented. You certainly have some experience with that one for, for sure. Um, so um, the the observation was that um, there are other protocols that do this, and um, the question is whether or not you consider that to be deployment experience. Um, you, I believe that Chat Roulette runs on one of them. Okay. If uh, I was not. I actually, I think I asked about this in the past, and I was not aware of like which ones actually used it because I, I was hoping to take a look and see um, what it looked like. But. Yeah, um, my understanding is that that's the underlying protocol model that Chat Roulette <laughs> runs on. Um, it's a very that, quirky example. <laughs> not that that's something that's particularly like. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe apropos of I nothing, so, but yeah. yes. That's right. No, no. Because they're almost, I mean, they're close enough. I believe that's what it was. Chat, so uh, Christian said it. Oh, that was a test application. Yes. Um, yes. So Martin added testing another something. Pro, uh, is is more unidirectional streams are are more generic, which is, I think yeah. that's that's reasonable. Applications can define their own mapping. Uh, they both can and must. So like it's it's a pro and a con. But like if you want a super optimized uh, mapping, then you know I think it's reasonable to think that like you might be able to do. <clears throat> some things more easily with this. Uh, although, I mean, I guess you could only use one half of a bi-directional screen, but it, as stated earlier, like the more you abuse that, the more it kind of becomes a little bit like ugly. So, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes, unidirectional plus a binding layer. Um, I'm not, this didn't get as much discussion on the list, so I'm a little concerned that some people didn't end up reading the PR in detail. Uh, but this was an idea of, we're gonna take unidirectional streams but add a binding layer back to the transport document. Uh, this is partially motivated by the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people, including myself, were unhappy about bidirectional streams being moved out of the transport document because I was concerned that everyone would just, like, re-implement them. Um, and the, so this adds a very functional binding layer back into the transport document on top of uh, unidirectional streams. Um, so it's... It, the transport document allows more things than uh, certainly unidirectional streams would, and even bidirectional streams do alone, including many to one is the most like obvious example. Um, it is, it's, it's kind of less general, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can also just use unidirectional, so I'm not sure if it's, um, it's certainly more complex than either of the first two options. It's sort of like, we want all the options. Um, it allows many to one, which is yeah, as well. Uh, and of course, there's no deployment experience. Um, the other thing I wanted to note about it is that it, it does this with one byte and one number at the beginning of the, the stream. So it sort of yep. like shoves the framing in the first few bytes of the like stream offset zero, um, which, which is a pro and a con. So the nice part is all this configuration stuff is set up at the beginning of the stream. Um, one major con is if you start receiving data out of order, you have no idea if it's like a unidirectional stream or a bidirectional stream or like a multi-directional stream or like what. You basically just have to buffer it and like deal with it later. Yeah, so. So um, Martin Thompson, I think the, the details of the pull request are probably only there as illustrative. There's a bunch of things in that pull request that I think go a little bit further than I would. I think that it could be very simple, but that one's gone a little bit further than, okay. than, than may be ideal. Um, and as you observe that, that particular bug, um, whether you consider that a bug, to the extent that you consider it a bug, don't consider that to be uh, a problem that's inherent to the, to the proposal. We could put a, a reflective stream ID in every single stream frame if we wanted to, or... I don't necessarily think this we need to, but... I don't think it, we need to. I, 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 I was agree. pointing out that... Yeah, like, it's, uh, there's a quirk. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and one of the advantages of the bidirectional stream thing is that every packet that, that you receive, every frame that you receive, you know which one it belongs to when you receive it's it. Super obvious. Yeah, cool. Uh, next slide. My last uh, slide. So, sorry, uh, oh. this is DKG. Just to clarify, I may have misunderstood the pull request here, but I believe it actually allows many to many, not just many to one. Uh, and you I, and might be, I think you're so, right. So, I mean. John and Martin, 
you're distracting folks. I, I think I think you're right. Yeah. So I think that's significantly more complex and confusing, and it makes me that that makes me nervous. Yes, it is definitely as yes, it's fairly complex. Uh, but thank you for noting that. I, I would, it does allow many to many, correct, Martin? I would. It's easy enough to pull as much of that out as we need. Just there, and there were four bits. Might as well define it if we think we might use it. So. Yeah, that was one of the features that I really, really didn't want, Mike. So um, <laughs> it's okay. like many to many. Is we like, can undefine them. <laughs> um, my, my wee brain exploded when I saw that. But oh well. <laughs> uh, all right, last slide. Things to think about. Um, server push is rare, uh, at least in my experience, it's well less than 1% of responses. Maybe people have different experiences, but it's it's like at this point, the optimization is just like not really a critical optimization for HTTP. Um, sticking with the current draft is an option. Um, if we if we can't reach a clear direction forward on anything else, um, it does work. Uh, as I said before, only plain bidirectional streams actually have implementation and deployment, so it's possible this is something to revisit when people have more running code. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, Quartz, which is quick WebRTC over quick, not quick over WebRTC, thank God, um, uses streams in a unidirectional way pretty abusively. Um, and the link is on there for the code. But um, it, it should provide us with actual real deployment experience in the relatively near future of, of an application that uses a lot of unidirectional streams. So OK. Anyway. Thank you, Ian. Um, that's it. Yes, that's okay. it. Okay. Um, so we've got 20 minutes, unless we want to start eating to our presentations to figure this out. Um, from my standpoint, and I think from our standpoint, we've talked about this a few times. And in those discussions, we've kind of said that we need to make this decision relatively soon if it's going to happen. Um, the longer we wait to do this, the harder it is going to be for people to rip it out of their code. They're going to, you know, build abstractions and build APIs and build applications based upon the current approach or, or whatever approach we take. So there, there's a certain amount of pressure on us to, to figure this out. Um, the only other thing I'll say is, is that we're seeing a couple times in, in, on the list and, and here it being inserted, we have deployment experience with one thing, deployment, we don't have a deployment experience with another thing. All I would say to that is, uh, in, in a sense that's true in that we have deployment experience with TCP. And I think that's what we're modeling a lot of what the current approach on. Um, the deployment experience of Quick is something that the whole working group doesn't have. A, a one or two members of it have. So, so don't personally, and this is not really with a chair hat on, but personally, I don't rely on that completely. You know, we, we need experience as a group to make decisions, not just from one or two implementers. Yeah. But I, I, I do see the TCP as a precedent there. That, that is something we can. So let's figure it out. Christian Ritema, uh, I, I'm going to speak there on this idea of having a, a mapping layer inside the transport. And I have a good reason to not want to do it. Uh, the good reason is the analysis of what it takes to do DNS push, which is a subscribe notify kind of model. And it's just that it's not just a question of mapping application transaction to streams, but we need an application model in that case to make sure that we have the right sequencing of application messages sent on multiple streams. I mean, there are like partial order enforcement and things like that. And, and if we add, I mean, I could map that to either a bidirectional model or unidirectional model but I would rather not have to fight with a predefined mapping at the transport layer. Tommy Polly, Apple. Um, so my inclination would be to stick with something that can, at least above the transport layer, provide a simple way to do bidirectionality, since that is going to be such common pattern in applications. Um, whether or not this is done by implementing the transport layer as unidirectional that, are, that is bound or as truly bidirectional in which you have the fin to close it, I don't think matters quite as much. 
to me, but a kind of wild west of unidirectional seems problematic. My main concern is that as I mean, we are focusing on HTTP now, which is great, but we want to use this for more things. And as we go ahead with that, um, everyone's going to have to come up with their own mapping in that case. And it's much more likely to get it wrong or add unnecessary levels of complexity there. To the API point, um, even over TCP, we do have experience with APIs that expose the read and write side as like separate streams versus a fully bound connection. And um, at least in the experience I've had, trying to manage these separate stream objects actually ends up making things much more complex for the application because now they have two separate sets of state to deal with um, as opposed to having a notion of a strong request reply, um, which is usually a better abstraction for them. So I think you can build anything you need with bidirectional that you just immediately close. If you want to do fancy things like unidirectional, you can do that. But it's just gonna be such a common abstraction due to bidirectional, I don't see the benefit of really breaking out from that now. Thank you. Um, Kazuho, firstly, uh, regarding which approach to choose, I'm afraid of the complexity of the unidirectional only, only approach. I think that the cost of BYOB, I mean, build your own bidirectional approach, can be found in the changes that are required to the HTTP mapping. I mean, the existence of the cancel request frame. Cancel request is a frame for canceling a request after the stream that has that carries the request has been closed. With the unidirectional only approach, a way to transmit such a kind such kind of frame becomes a must for any request response application protocol. In other words, if we adopt the unidirectional only approach, every request response protocol that will be built on top of Quick either needs to define its own control string or refrain from using fin to indicate the end of the request. I don't think that we should have such a requirement for every application protocol, even though it's not problematic for HTTP since we have other needs for a control string. Thank you, Zero. Martin. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Christian. Um, part of the point of this one here was to, it, it, was, it was in reaction to those people who thought that the transport needed a bidir bidirectional primitive. And for those people that wanted to provide that bidirectional primitive in their APIs, this would allow that to be to be built relatively <coughs> trivially. It's not a lot of not a lot of complexity. Um, it's I, I believe that it's actually strictly less complex than the um, unidirectional one. Um, Kazuo makes a good point um, regarding the the cancel request thing. Um, I hadn't considered that at all. Uh, however, I think we need that anyway for other reasons, and that primarily that's the push thing that we, we were talking about doing anyway. Um, I have a question, Martin. Uh, can I clarify, why do you think it's less complex? Because fundamentally you're just building on top of the, um, the, the unidirectional thing. And it's, it's the, in, in the, to the extent that it has complexity, it's emerging complexity, and, and it is because you're providing uh, fundamentally um, simpler building blocks that are more capable. Okay. And you can you can build more complexity with it, but it equally, if you want to, and I would suggest that most people building one of these things would probably do this, is that you would do the absolute simple possible thing. You would either provide a, you send messages one way, and you send messages the other way as an API, or you would provide a, please make me a stream that is bidirectional as an API, and you can do both of those things relatively easily with th this sort of thing. And so I think from a, uh, both an implementation perspective and a, uh, a usage perspective, it is simpler. The fact that you can go to many to one is 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 a complexity that you gain, but it's not necessarily complexity you have to take. It's optional. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask is because uh, both of the PRs, when you stack them, are like over 400 extra lines, and so uh, I don't know how much of that is due to some features we need to. I think that's and mainly, edit mainly editorial, and I think that when you look at your proposal to, to add the extra bit, there was a, there were a number of things there that I didn't really push on very much. That yeah, we I, need to like there's implications throughout, and I I actually went through and did an extremely thorough pass of both of, of like all of the documents, and found that there were a lot of um, inconsistencies in the way that we treated the state of streams, 
and I fixed a lot of those in the process. And so um, what you're seeing is editorial collateral in those things more than anything else. And so when yeah. it's 400 lines, uh, I wouldn't read too much into that. Okay. Uh, I think the core question here is whether something like cancel request is too costly. And I think we discussed this briefly, <coughs> but um, the, the idea of ass assigning a different identifier to, to pushes um, and having that sort of um, identified uh, independent of stream identifiers was a valuable thing. And um, we probably want to pursue that anyway, and then we lead into the cancel request thing um, as a natural consequence of that. So um, just just saying that some of the complexity here is 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 stuff that we we have to take on anyway. It's just a consequence of you know the way the documents are structured and whatnot that you're seeing that they look somewhat large. Okay. You've got a pretty deep queue, so try and keep it brief, folks. Hi, Sabot Angar. Um, so I've had some experience implementing the bidirectional stream API, uh, bidirectional stream abstraction for the transport. Uh, so one of the complex things of doing the implementation was the half-closed state. So initially when Martin proposed the pure unidirectional stream, I was very drawn to it because there's no half-closed state anymore. But the more I thought about it and discussed it with some of the coworkers is that um, you can actually model even a bidirectional transport with two unidirectional state machines. And it gets most of the way there. And uh, I'd rather take on the complexity of implementing all of that than like shoving complexity back in the applications, which have to, uh, and your complexity is now split between two places. Um, so in that case, I'm, I favor either the do nothing approach. So that's, I don't mind sending the extra fin bit. It's, there's no extra RTTs incurred by that. Uh, it's just awkward. Um, or the app directed close approach. So, um, Something that was brought up during the uh, during in the mailing list was that it won't enable generic application quick proxies to be built. But I think that that's a use case that I don't know whether we should be thinking about because we're building quick as an integrated TLS HTTP uh, transport, and it is inherently integrated with the application, and that's where most of the performance advantages of quick do come from. So layering in an artificial way seems uh, counterintuitive to the design goals of quick to build an integrated transport. That being said, I agree with the, some of the proposals. Um, some of the things that were added to the unidirectional streams uh, were kind of very unique, stream correlators and stuff like that. I would like to see that in the HTTP mapping and cancel request as a, as a substitute for disinterest or something like that. That would be much better to do those disinterest things in the application layer. I could talk about more offline. Uh, Eric Petrola, um, Sorry, one second. Uh, we're going to close the uh, mic lines pretty soon. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Another rush to the back <laughs> after I'm finished, just in case. Um, the queue's closed. Uh, very good. I'll just filibuster if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just say two oh, minutes. Why second. don't you take a minute? Um, one minute's fifty seconds. You want to remark? Um, Try to kick me off. Um, so first, l l let us not uh, use mass of uh, change set as a proxy for um, for, for complexity. Um, lest people be inclined to produce change sets, which are the incentivized to change sets are far less complete than necessary in an attempt to make their thing appear less complex. Sure. Um, uh, so um, you know, at, at the, the half closed thing is a total disaster everywhere we have to do it. So. Um, uh, like Sabode, I was initially extremely drawn to unidirectional only, which completely eliminates the complexity of having to mess around with that crap. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, th I think it is the case that um, applications are going to desire some kind of thing, and so you know, either you know either we're going to need a protocol or we need a convention, and a convention start to, convention start to look a lot like a protocol. So um, with that, I think that. Uh, but that said, I think it's pretty clear unidirectional is a more fundamental design primitive um, rather than bidirectional. So. Um, um, I, I think, on balance, we should be providing a layer that builds, you know, you bidirectional on top of unidirectional. Um, I'm, I'm pretty unmoved by the deployment experience argument in this case. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, it, it, this is this is a programming concept. Um, it's not one that is, that is a matter of having huge amounts of scale. Um, so, uh, you know. Um, and, and, and certainly, we have plenty of experience with trying to map unidirectional on top of bidirectional, and that is a mess. So, 
Um, you know, I, I can understand people saying, well, I'd like to see an implementation of this. Um, I think that's not a reasonable request, but I don't think that like we have to have, you know, five years deployment experience is like a, a possible argument for this change. Okay. But to, I should have clarified that none of the last three options have either implementations or uh, deployment experience. I, I agree with that. And okay. I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that, you, that, that we, you'd like to defer this decision until we have implementation experience. I, I don't think it's reasonable by the way to say, because we don't have implementation experience, we should decide that's one fine. way. Hi, Brian Trammell. Let me add to the chorus of people saying I intended to come up here to say unidirectional is all you get at the beginning, and um, I'm actually kind of convinced that we need to do something where you have primitive unidirectional underneath and something bidirectional on top to keep applications from having to do it themselves. It seems like sort of the way to go. Um, I, so yeah, I agree with about. I completely disagree with this framing because I think that if if we basically say that quick is just for HTTP2, um, so. Um, then we are likely to make reasoning a little bit further down here that's going to be hard to pull ourselves back out of. I would point out that we do have a lot, well, a lot, some experience with hacking unidirectional protocols on top of bidirectional streams anyway. IPFIX is a very good example of this. It uses It was designed for UDP unidirectional only, and then it went to the ISG, and they said congestion control, and then we're like, oh, we're transport people. We have no idea what that is. Um, and you, know, you basically, huh? No. Please continue. Right. Um, it's Friday. Uh, shit, there went my train of thought. Oh, so yeah, I mean, so basically you have, you know, a fundamentally bidirectional um, thing that you're writing things on top, or that you write on top of, and usually what people have done there is say, okay, well, I'm going to open a full bidirectional stream, I'm just going to use one half of it, right? And I don't really care about the fin at the end, right? So having a... There, but there are other ways that you could do that, right? You could also say, okay, I'm actually going to go to half close, and maybe one application will say, okay, well, half close means that I'm going to tear everything all the way down, and the other application says, no, I have to leave it open. So really, we need a way to keep applications from doing this on their own. That we have from, from implementation experience of unidirectional applications over bidirectional flows. I don't know if that was useful, so I'm going to sit down now. It was. Thank you, Brian. Um, Janai Angar, just a couple of quick thoughts. One, I uh, I did want to say that there's in the unidirectional stream PR there is actually one idea which I like quite a bit. Um, the the correlator for the for push streams is actually quite a neat idea, and I would like to see that separated as a PR and not just like bundled yep. with all of this. But I think that's a really cool idea that we should use no matter which way we go. Um, but in general, I wanted to say that uh, there's there's uh, as other folks have noted before me. Transports, transports generally build common design patterns into them. This is not just for quick. It has traditionally been the case. SCTP did the same thing. The whole idea of offering an API is to build things that the simplest transport would be UDP, of course. It is technically a transport, and the application could do everything. Some people might, in fact, call quick an application protocol. The whole point here is that we are taking common design patterns from things that applications build and build them into a shared piece, which we call the transport. The shared piece is congestion control, it's loss recovery, it's multi-streaming, and as it turns out, in the bidirectional streams is a common case that almost every application that I know uses. Unidirectional streams are things that they may use. Uh, with HTTP2, we do see that to some degree it does use it, and most deployments actually don't, as you pointed out, with server push. Um, but bidirectionality is something that we really, really should retain in the transport. Kyle Rose, um, rather than rehash all the previous arguments, I just want to say it seems like we should optimize for the bidirectional case, which is the common case and may indefinitely be so. So I like the simplicity of the single bit approach. I did have one question um, about the the many to one. Did we actually have an application that we intended for that? <laughs> that was Brad's question as well. I don't oh, know. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I did, missed that. Did Martin? Do you have, maybe Martin has an application that he intended for that? Or um, I mean, Mike. that was it for me. <laughs> yeah. So Martin Thompson, um, the application that we have is HTTP. Um, just to make. Like the way that H2 works is it's many to one. Um, now, not necessarily saying that I would use that particular primitive to build it in HTTP2 because we have <coughs> particular requirements that mean that it, it would be a better fit to do all of this at the, at the application layer. And we have the flexibility to do that. Um, so if Kyle is out, I wanted to 
touch on a couple of points. Um, this builds on disinterest, which was a proposal that Mike put together and we haven't managed to close on, but I think everyone um, basically agreed on that one, which moves the bidirectional model a little closer to the unidirectional model, but keeps, keeps the bridging state. Um, what else was it? Oh yes, um, Jana's plea, I actually agree with and are convinced with that. Um, you, could, you could, if you like, consider the original uh, unidirectional streams proposal as simply shifting the Overton window. Um, but Overton window, look it up on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll explain later. Um, but um, I've, I've been convinced by the arguments about the transport um, needing to provide this common set, set of functionality. Um, I'll point out that we did bump something off the presentation where um, Jana will be arguing for removing a common capability from the transport because the transport simply cannot actually reasonably understand the application uh, semantics. So um, in summation, I think um, I would rather build up rather than build up then down. And I prefer the, the, um, the, the binding layer one. I think that's um, that's where I'm at for this one, um, simply because we get the primitives and then we build on top of those primitives rather than build a more complex primitive and then have to wind it back. That's just my preference. Um, that's just the way I like to build things. And um, I think that gives us the flexibility that we that we actually need. And maybe we don't use it in HTTP2 because we actually need more complex things, but because we have the simpler thing, we can build the more complex thing ourselves. Carl, you can, if you want to. I have anything to say other than if we go with the layered approach where you start with unidirectional and build bidirectional on top of that, it's almost like you're building two separate state machines. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know, I like the simplicity of having the one state machine the overhead of sending a single bit along with the type saying, you know, just ignore the other direction seems, I don't know, it, it seems simpler to me. So, okay. Seems. We did, we As did a close the yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so we're eating into our presentation time officially now. Um, I think, can, can we, uh, does anyone want to advocate for any of the other, and I apologize if you already did and I missed it, the other unidirectional proposals, or can we consider this the unidirectional proposal on the table right now? Is that a fair assumption? The binding layer one, yes. Is, Sorry? It, it is a binding layer. Is it inaccurate? <laughs> okay. Maria, you want to clarify? Yeah, I think there's strong agreement that we need something in the transport. The, the question is, do we start with unidirection as a basic principle or bidirection as a basic principle? That, that's, a, that's a good, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. That, that might actually be something we can hum or show of hands on. I think so, hum, yeah. yeah. So um, how should we compose this? Uh, hum if you... I would do three. Three? I would do, I would do not enough information to make a decision or, or hum one and two uh, of unidirectional bidirection. We can go back to the second slide or something. Okay. The high level concept. Ah, no, two more. Okay. That's, that's the. Just clarification. Are we humming on the proposals or are we humming on principles? Yeah. The, the, what should we start from? I think Miria made a nice suggestion now. How Very we, much so. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem, though, is that we have specific proposals attached to those principles. We do. So Which I don't we'll know how you to. separate those. Yeah. Um, we, it's sort of a dissection. You, you, of where we are. It is, and, and you can choose to view it as if you hum that, that you think we should start from bidirectional streams. The implication is we're going to stay pretty much where we are, but of course things will change as they are changing. Uh, but that will be the basis that we're working on. Um, so let's do unidirectional, then bidirectional, then not. Let's do those two. I'm frightened of no, not enough no information, hums, but yeah. No okay. Hums. Yes. I, oh, yeah. I think that enough information <laughs> might be valuable. I think I mean, okay. there, there are people in this room probably who have changed their opinion recently and or have not like read all the PRs or like okay. kind of thought. I, I don't know. I think it's probably worth. So the first hum is 
if you believe we should base uh, the abstraction in Quick on unidirectional streams, the implication being that we may provide an additional abstraction on top of that. Okay, it's not helping you, right? That's free. So Just look at the beach and relax, Ecker. It's all okay. Okay. So uh, please hum if you believe we should start on a basis of unidirectional streams. Okay. And Mike Bishop and Jabber is also humming okay. uh, non so, non non Healthy, healthy hum. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, please hum if you believe we should start from a basis of bidirectional streams. Oh, that is very close. Close, slight perhaps a slight, stronger, but slight bias towards bidirectional. Slight. Hum if you don't know, or you need more information or time to think. All right. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so my job's done. We had we had two in the Jabber for bidirectional. We had one in the Jabber for unidirectional. Just for the minutes. So uh, maybe would be interesting to find from the folks who hum for unidirectional whether it should be unidirectional only or with with a bidirectional abstraction on top of it. We're, no, not only from those, but in general. So, so if we were yeah, to sure. go if we with were to the unidirectional... Up. So, Mark, I would, I would actually request that you instead ask anyone who thinks we should have unidirectional only to stand up and advocate for it, because I don't think there's any of those people left. I, I, I suspect you're correct. Do we have anyone who wants to advocate for unidirectional only? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that seems to, to be clear then. Right. Um, Yeah, well, well, okay. I also want to make sure that it's clear that the bidirectional stream support one means that it's bidirectionality with the potential for unidirectional support with either a bit or with application layer logic. It's we are talking about similar abstraction, and that's important to note. Even though we start with bidirectionality, it, it it can easily encompass unidirectionality as a as a as an extension or or as a case we already do it. Okay. There you go. I would state that I don't think a lot of people are very passionate about one or the other approach. Um, so that's good because that means we can find some agreement at some point, I believe. Um, and I would propose to actually go and go into the details for both sites and, and propose one proposal for both sites and figure out all the details there and then make a decision. Okay. Um, so I, I did hear one of the complaints about the, you know, any of the international scene proposals was that no one had tried to do it. Um, so I'm always willing to try doing an, an implementation in Mink by Seattle. So that, you know, either I'll be able to report that I was wrong, I'm an idiot, and it sucks, or I'll be able to show that it, that it can be done, and people can take a look and see how much they think, what they think for themselves. OK. Um, and that, that's actually interesting, if we can get some running code, yeah. which implies that uh, I think it's, uh, a pigeon, it, it's on onto the proponents to come up with a proposal Get an implementation together, get some running code, and, and, and then report back. I think that's I think I think that, that it's reasonable to say. Okay. I mean, Martin, I, I don't know. Hey. It, okay. Is it reasonable to have that that code be kind of similar to your existing bidirectional implementation, like so, like in the same code base or something? So yeah, 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 yeah. One could code review it. Yeah. Okay, um, cool. I, I, cool. I have to. Yeah, no, I was gonna like rewrite it in Rust. Uh, um, oh God, uh, no. I mean, you yeah, know, no, I, I, I was agreeing. Okay, that's great. So. That sounds like next steps. Um, I, mean, I, I guess I don't have a fully fleshed out bidirectional thing yet either, but um, I have enough to do. I have to, enough, enough to do this HTTP 09 thing, so that's sure. probably what we need. So, so um, if you want to do, uh, I don't know, do it as, as a branch and uh, I'll together. figure something out. Okay. Okay. I, I meant on the spec. I'm looking oh, yeah, yeah. for the, for the spec part as well as the code. Yeah. Uh, just the, the longer we go without you know making decision here, the decision kind of becomes more difficult to change from the status quo. So. Yeah, so um, I, I will make a pull request um, conveniently. I have a unidirectional stream pull request that I can build on, um, following okay. the principle of unidirectionality first, and uh, I think that will be pretty straightforward. Okay, <laughs> Let, let's close this off then. Is that, Martin, from that perspective, is there anything else you'd like to know from the room that would help you when you're going in that direction? So um, one thing that I was considering doing was pulling out the push ID thing that was in there. Um, if people object to that, then I'd like to know, but I'd like to 
sort of try to pull it out somehow and and make some progress on that that independently that's going to muck things up though if we can't get that resolved so i'd like a pretty clear signal that this is the right thing to do i'm getting I thumbs support up from that. Ian, at least I, um if, if anyone doesn't want that then please speak now because it's going to make it a whole lot more difficult with parallel changes for push IDs and rebasing and all that sort of other mess to get this to, to work. So just making that clear. Oh, and the other thing is I want disinterest. Can we please have disinterest? If anyone doesn't um, wants to object to that, then please state otherwise. I want to have that in as well before we, we start on this process because that one's kind of foundational as well on the bi-directional side. Okay. Uh, one more question about clarification. is. Can we get an idea of people actually want many to one? That was kind of seen as a, I think, a somewhat controversial pro and con. Do we, do we think that? We I, want I don't think. I think we can talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll look forward to hearing back from you in Seattle then. So next up, uh, we have Ingemar. Um, we are over time. Hi. Great. Hi. All right, so we have uh, three presentations, uh, so if you could uh, be as, as quick as you can, we'd really appreciate it. I will try my best, and I will try my best, and I hear my own voice quite, I hear my own voice quite, so hope that will, uh, hope that will uh, eke off. And, uh, okay, I will, uh, if you bring up, should I bring up the presentation, or do you bring it up or on the screen? We have it on, oh, no, I'm sorry, we don't have it on the screen, one moment. Yeah. It's on my screen, but that doesn't help anyone else. calming the room. OK, great. I know we can uh, briefly go through the introduction. I hope that most people uh, around uh, understand by now what the ECN is. And uh, there was some discussion on the mailing list a couple of months ago. And that was uh, unknown. But uh, to make it real quick is that it uh, makes it possible for congested nodes to mark instead of Discord packets. And uh, that uh, we forget if need more information there is a truckload of information out there one is a uh, one good way to start with rfc 3168 for instance and and also that uh, what is more uh, has more traction right now is that it's a key component in low loss low latency for uh, scalable throughput that is uh, subject for to a full standardization in uh, near the transport working group and the objective is to get the ECN support in quick already from the beginning. And, uh, and the part is to implement necessary support for ECN that involves uh, negotiation or uh, capability exchange and the feedback part for it. And uh, uh, this is a draft that is uh, written, but it's not uh, quite natural that this will be a working group item because uh, much, much of the parts will uh, likely end up in, uh, in separate, in, for instance, uh, the other sort of loss recovery and the uh, protocol drafts that are already existing. Uh, and we have uh, had uh, some uh, email exchange in a uh, limited circle and uh, people have been, uh, who have been involved in uh, this uh, are listed below. Can you take the next slide, please? And the outline of the draft is the, the quick specific uh, part is the ECN negotiation or capability sensing. And, and at least for now, it's sort of suggested to be performed after connection set up, uh, but uh, that is, can be subject to a change and uh, probably something that needs to be discussed in the working group. Can you do it already at uh, connection set up? And then also there is a description of the ECN feedback that uh, now goes into act frames. And then you have some parts of it uh, so that are less covered in a draft and uh, needs more uh, uh, sort of a text is uh, how to do monitoring and why to do it and also some uh, general fallback uh, issues and uh, operating system socket specifics. Uh, there are sort of a more uh, sort of uh, implementation specific reports with uh, OS circuit specifics. Okay, next one. And then here we have this uh, negotiation capability sensing. And uh, for now, it takes place after connection setup. And uh, the, uh, the rationale right now is to avoid that DCN uh, failures delay the connection setup. 
And uh, it's no matter how lo- unlikely it is. And also, for instance, it's uh, Apple work that uh, has been done and to, to uh, look at how sensitive it is to run uh, to run ECN ne- negotiation for TCP. And it seems like there is no there are no major issues with ECN having the ECN bits uh, set today. And also, uh, there is some uh, work one can lo- rely on for this uh, as regards to our. Uh, uh, direction for this is uh, the general CCN uh, work that is in uh, TCPM working group. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's just implemented as a two octet ECN negotiation frame. And uh, for now, the, both peers send the ECN negotiation frame and they echo, echo it, them back. And from from then, uh, from that uh, exchange, you can sort of de- determine if you can run ECN in one or both directions. And uh, there's some combination there, but uh, that needs to be clarified. Uh, the IP header bits are uh, currently set to 1 1, but uh, it could be uh, for when the ECN negotiation frames are transmitted. But uh, the question is uh, should it be ECT0 or ECT1? That is sort of one uh, that uh, could be more. Uh, more reasonable to have, have them set to ECT1 or 0. Okay, we can take the next slide. The ECN echo is implemented as a byte counter, and it's sort of a rival length field depending on uh, how this uh, the ECT, ECT0, ECT1, and C uh, bits are marked. So we don't, uh, in the in a minimum case, if you don't have any marked packets at all, either the whole zero zero, the, the, the overhead you get is one octet. And that's just sort of first byte here. And, uh, and it is possible, in, at least in theory, to report ECN, even though ECN is not negotiated, or if uh, for some reason would like to have it like that. And the question is that that, is some, uh, that uh, also the recovery draft is silent us in uh, is uh, how are bytes counted? Do we count, count only the quick header or is it the quick plus UDP header or is it also the IP header? And that is something that need, maybe needs to uh, raise an issue in the tracker. On, uh, I haven't done it yet, but maybe somebody has a more uh, clear uh, point of how it should be counted. Uh, clarifying comment. Uh, in the there was an issue opened, and in the most recent recovery draft, uh, bytes in flight is explicitly defined. Uh, bytes in flight that means uh, including uh, the UDP header or only the quick header. Uh, I believe it is defined as including the quick header and not the UDP or IP header. Okay, well, as long as we are clear on that one. Okay, thanks. Ingemar, I have a clarification question as well. Um, for is there any value in tagging this information onto the ACK header since I don't think you use anything in the actual ACK header? This could be a separate frame in this form, right? Uh, possibly, on. Uh, oh, okay, so just, just one question. So because the reason I would put it, so, so if we put it in the ACK frame, um, I wonder if it would actually be useful to have per act block information about what was marked. Or you could even do something like the timestamps and for the first 256 report individual marks rather than just aggregate byte levels. I wonder if that would be interesting from a congestion control standpoint, but just a, you know, something to think about. Yeah, uh, we have the region. We have some more detailed information about exactly which ECN, uh, which packets are that were uh, ECN marked in which uh, way. But we couldn't uh, really find out any uh, good reason to keep uh, that detailed information. But yeah. hi, Ingar. I think for um, accurate ECN, that might actually be useful. Uh, what you're pointing out there. The, uh, uh, what Lars pointed out that would be useful for accurate ECN, but for for otherwise for ECN itself, just general 3168, this should be adequate. And I, I agree that doing it in a separate frame seems like a completely plausible yeah. thing. I guess my meta comment is, if we want to put this into the ACK frame, um, it would be useful to put as much information as possible into the encoding rather than re- just reporting aggregates, right? 
because because they can go into a different frame type. Um, it's, especially if we can encode it in a very lightweight way that doesn't make the act frame much longer. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, no, that no, maybe something that needs to be uh, discussed more on uh, how uh, which which alternative is the best. And I believe uh, I'm. Personally, I'm uh, positive to uh, almost any way of implementing it, and as soon as, as long as we have ECN support, in some way, so it's not. Okay, we can take the next slide. I don't believe there is much. Uh, okay, so the other you have this monitoring, and uh, it can be useful for indication of parts that do not implement ECN support correctly. And I believe uh, we have a uh, we all always see sort of uh, real life issues that. Uh, that uh, doesn't only deal with ECN flaws. It could be the packet errors are mysteriously dropped in the network. And here we had uh, an extra element of uh, uncertainty on uh, that it can, uh, that ECN mark pack in various ways can be sort of dropped and uh, can be remarked. And, and the details are to be fined. And uh, also how to do ECN fault detection and fall back and you know, sort of a different uh, sort of alternatives that they can fail. And, and a large part is that the uh, operating stock gets specific. And the question is, of course, here, that, uh, should the quick working group deal with that, or is it uh, something that should be left up to implementation? Is there is a separate draft needed to cover this? Um... So on the last point, uh, I think this is not in scope for quick, but um, the draft or or a document might talk about what is required from the operating system to imp actually implement this, mm. like access to the, the bits, right? Yeah. Mm. OK. Thanks. The next slide here. And the way forward is uh, that the suggested way is, that, uh, is to add ECN negotiation and ECN uh, echo to the, the transport draft. And ECN classic handling to the quick recovery because there is also, I believe, it's assumed that uh, you uh, that the uh, Reno is used and one can add the extra sort of a sort of a uh, pseudocode or whatever to the, the quick recovery draft to cover ECN as well. Then we have ECN, the L4S handling, and uh, as the L4S is still uh, sort of a work in progress, it's uh, probably too early to bring uh, L4S handling uh, into the drafts. And uh, but uh, uh, maybe some kind of placeholders to sort of keep the door open and avoid that you have misuse of the ECT1 uh, uh, sort of a code point, for instance. So I believe that's about it. I don't know if there was any. It's, yeah. Uh, questions yeah. and comments are always welcome. Um, yeah. yeah, we probably have a few minutes for discussion. One sort of, can you go back one slide, Mark? So one comment fr from me uh, would be that if we want to do this, I think the, the <coughs> negotiation and, and the reporting is obviously what we need to nail down first so that we have a stable wire format. Um, the, how it applies in draft recovery and whether it's classic handling or, or something better than classic is, is further off. And I think L4S specifically is, is pretty far off still since transport. Uh, TSVWG doesn't even quite know what that's going to look like and how it's going to hit hmm. them. No. So, so I, if we do this, I would really focus on the, on the first bullet here. Gori. Thanks, Lars. Gori Fairhurst. Um, TSVWG chair in this case. Um, I think the, the key thing is exactly as Lars said, so I agree with Lars, um, well, let's pin down whether we're sending ECN on the wire, let's pin the basic feedback, let's make sure ECT1 and ECT0 are different, and let's avoid defining a new ECN reaction here. Um, other groups are doing that, TCPM's got some active work, um, TSBWG has active work on the algorithm for how to respond. But the feedback frames and whether it goes on the wire image are absolutely things that I think are important to consider here. Uh, Stuart Chersher, Apple. Uh, I expect many of you know that I'm a big proponent of ECN. And listening to this, I was thinking, why negotiate it at all? 
why not just specify that we use ECN? And, and I realized the answer to that question is actually not the network itself. I think Apple has done a good job flushing out all the cobwebs. Uh, <laughs> but the OS APIs are an issue. That, uh, and we don't want the situation where somebody implements quick on a device where the API doesn't let you get at the uh, CE bits, and then we just end up with a, a misbehaving ECN client that's ignoring the mark. So unfortunately, we do need to make sure that the receiver signal to the other end, I can't do this. Correct. So Martin Thompson, brief comment. The, um, the ability to separate this into separate frames means that we can imp incrementally implement this. Um, though I do see Lars point about the integration with the timing and whatever else, if there is an optimization there, I think perhaps we want to talk about making that optional um, or, or thinking very, very hard about whether we integrate it tightly with, with act frames or something like that because it's going to make our already difficult implementation task that much more difficult. And act frames are a nightmare as they are and this really only makes them worse. Jana Ingar, I, um, I disagree. I think that if, but actually maybe not. Um, maybe I, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, 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 I think that if it can be done, uh, if it can be compressed into the act frame, it'd be much better because going into the future, um, we are TCPM, TSPWG, they're all looking at proposals that actually look at uh, a more detailed ECN information. This is what I meant by accurate ECN. And if we can put this information to the ACK frame, it uh, obviates the need for revisiting this framing again later. So I think it's useful to be able to do that. Um, I do have a question about the the um, the current state of affairs. Uh, do you know which, uh, Ingemar, do you know which operating systems currently support the API? to expose uh, CE bits up into user space and allow for the application to write into, um, um, yeah. Uh, so I don't have, uh, yeah. I don't have the, all the details and uh, I haven't looked too much into it myself, but I know Pierce O'Hanna did a quite extensive uh, survey into it uh, a year or so back and it, it can probably have changed. And, uh, I don't have the details, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, that might be useful to actually document in the draft. Hmm. Yeah. We have okay. eight minutes left. I think. Yeah, we have to cut the queue now. So, um, quick interject. We're not going to get to any of the other presentations related work. Very sorry, but I think this is, we want to let this run because we might want to take a hum at the end whether we want to CPRs for this um, first part. Um, I, I agree with John or maybe disagree. Um, <laughs> uh, more, more seriously, um, uh, I, I, I think I would really rather see this in a separate frame. As Martin said, the act frame is already like hideously overcomplicated. Um, the other thing is, you know, in the service of some notion of layering, um, you know, one might imagine running quick over networks which don't have IP and don't have ECN and like saying this is an integral part of like the system just seems like goofy in terms of layering. Um, you know, if, uh, it, at the point where we think this is like essential and baked, we can invent a new act frame. And, and it's important to put them in act frame. We can invent a new act frame, which, um, you know, which integrates them properly when that is well understood. And, um, you know, uh, when, when, that, when, that, when, when this problem is actually well understood, I mean, the, the notion of having extensible protocols, you can do those kinds of things. Um, so I think in, in both cases, no matter if you have it in the act frame or in a separate frame, you can find a way to, to um, cover the case where you don't have ECN support and you have like no overhead. Like you could even find two act frames, one without and one with ECN. Um, or like or like if you have it in a separate frame, the concern was that you don't get enough timing information, but then you can decide how often you send the separate frame and then you also get this kind of information. So you can. You can do both of those things with both approaches. The difference is like how much is the overhead, and I think we can actually do some more analysis um, and uh, going through those approaches and then making assumption about how much markings you get, how much loss you get, and then actually calculate a number how much overhead it would be in overhead it would be in those situations. 
uh, Koen de Schepper. Um, I agree that we should focus on the wire protocol and that we should make that uh, wire protocol as simple as possible. Uh, and, and the focus is on echoing what the application can see as the receiving <coughs> packets uh, in the IP header and echo that state to the uh, sender. So if that is fixed, uh, we can build the dynamics around it in the uh, sender only. Um, and so this protocol should be as simple as possible to implement by the receiver. Uh, it should take as less as header uh, uh, room in the act frame. And um, well, in, in that case, it, it should also be mandatory, I think, uh, on every ACK, probably. So it's probably best to fit it inside the ACK frame and not uh, spend another header or, or room in uh, an extra separate header. OK? OK. Thank you. So my suggestion would be that we do a quick hum, and, and the hum would basically be to understand whether we should devote working group time to ECN um, going forward or um, not, right? And not doesn't mean we don't ever do ECN, it means we revisit it at a later pace, uh, at a later time. Um, and devoting time to our, towards it doesn't mean it's a sure thing. No, devoting time means that we, we talk more about it now. Corey. Clarification question. Are we talking about just including the possibility of supporting it and not necessarily going in the algorithms, or are we talking about the two together? So, so I think, so personally, I think the, if we do this, the most important thing is understanding um, whether the integration of the signaling information with the ACK frame is required for efficiency or whether it can be efficiently done in a separate frame type. If it can be efficiently done in a separate frame type, that is nice because it decouples the two, right? If they need to be coupled together because otherwise you would duplicate a lot of information that's already in the ACK frame, right? Um, that would, um, you know, make implementations much more complex. But I, so I don't know if it's required, right? Um, if we do this, I think this would be what I would like to see analyzed first. Right, whether there's efficiency reasons for having the ECN information in the ACK frame. I hope the answer is no, but I, I, I don't know, right? So that, 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 but that's actually step two. <laughs> step one is, <coughs> does the working group actually think that ECN is something that we need to begin devoting time to yeah. going forward? I think Starting... I, I got an answer to my clarification question. Okay. Thank you. Is this a clarification question? Okay. Okay. Because we're almost out of time. Right. So let's do this. This hum. Do, if you uh, believe that the working group should start to devote some time to ECN um, starting tomorrow, uh, please hum. All right. Um, if you believe uh, this is not necessary at, at this time, please hum. Okay. I would summarize this as pretty strong consensus for devoting. Uh, time to ECN going forward. Martin. Strong, strong interest in it. Yeah. Consensus is a yeah, consensus word. Is strong word. Yeah, yeah. Martin Thompson, I'd encourage those people who hummed against to take this to the list. It, and it seemed like there was one or two strong the concerns. Um, yeah. um, maybe, obviously we're gonna spend a little bit of time beating on this to get it into shape so that it's <coughs> integrated into the draft, so I'm not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. but we need to, understand those concerns before we sink a whole lot of effort into into that integration so that we can deal with that so yeah. I, that's, fine. that's fine and i don't think this is something that is is blocking our other discussions yeah. or that we should divert resources from i, I think so, that's so the same I, I would give sort of the, the ecn proponents maybe some homework assignment and specifically to think about um the, the two different options right one having ecn in quick in a way that is its own um frame types and if that is, if there's some significant disadvantages to that approach to, um, you know, discuss them and, and come up with an alternative that would be significantly better by, for example, integrating information with the act frame. But I think personally, I would really prefer if we could, you know, we have frame types, let's use them, right? So, uh, Janayanga, just a quick note that something that's important, I think, here is the ability to actually use this in real implementations right now. 
as it stands, most operating systems do not offer an API that can be used to actually do ECN. So we can choose to spend time on this right now, but bear in mind that it's not, it's gonna be hard to actually use this in the real world at the moment. Agreed. Which means that interoperability testing will suffer. I didn't catch that acoustically. Which means that interop testing will suffer. Interop testing will suffer. Right. Gory, you get the last word. Yeah. Cool. Um, Gory first. Um, yeah. Um, and the first thing to decide actually is whether we want ECN in the framework. And that's going to inform that whether the wire image should, should allow setting those bits on the wire, whether it's possible. And yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not going to talk because I realize it's time to leave. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, we will see some of you in Seattle yes. and many more of you in Singapore, I suspect. And we sh if we don't have the Doodle registration Doodle live yet, it'll be live soon and we'll send an email to the... Yeah. I it is live. We'll, just, it is we'll, live. Send a, we'll send a so reminder. Start registering for Seattle if you plan on coming because I'm sure Martin Duke would like to have some uh, accurate numbers soon uh, for how much coffee he needs to buy. It's not a Doodle. It's a Google form. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Ingemar. Thank you. Thank you.